On today's episode of the McCann Dogs Podcast. In any of the situations you might run into in your day-to-day life, we want you to think about things from the dog's perspective and think about what it tells them and what sort of ideas it makes them think are okay. And now, Instructor Shannon. Welcome back to the McCann Dogs Podcast. It is season five and we are in the studio today. I am joined with Instructor Swanee. Hi everyone. And my name is Instructor Shannon. If you are tuning in for the first time, welcome to the McCann Dogs Podcast. And of course, if you've been here before, as always, we like to say welcome back to McCann Dogs. And today we have a really... um, We have a really good discussion planned, and it is meant to shed some light on some of the mistakes that people make without necessarily knowing that they're making mistakes. And I'm so sorry, Honda. I forgot to introduce you, and I can understand completely why you're now at the mic saying, excuse me, yes, excuse me. (laughs) Well, you you weren't here at the beginning. That's what happened. (laughs) You were on the floor. (laughs) We always want to make sure, of course, that we have advice represented from every angle. So we have our dog expert in the house. (laughs) So with our podcast today, our goal is to talk about some of the common mistakes that people will inadvertently make with their dogs. We don't want to live by our dog's rules because dogs don't understand what it's like to live in a human world by our rules until we tell them. So it, the reverse of what I've said is really important. We want the dogs to live by our rules because we know that human rules in a human world are going to keep the dogs safe. So uh, I, I like to boil down this whole concept of how do you know whether you're living by your rules or your dog's rules with a couple of key points. And they are, one, whenever I'm thinking, okay, should I allow this? Shouldn't I allow this? I think, what does it feel like from the dog's perspective? And then the other two things that I think about are, what is the message that I'm giving my dog by doing this thing? And what is the message that I want my dog to get by doing this thing? And I compare those. And if they don't match, I'm in trouble. I need to adjust something to help my dog. So in any of the situations that you might run into in your day-to-day life, we want you to think about things from the dog's perspective and think about the motivation that it's going to create in them. Think about what it tells them and what sort of ideas it makes them think are okay. And we'll get into some examples to clarify this. So this topic actually came from um, a comment on our YouTube channel, on one of the videos on our YouTube channel where we were holding a puppy up in arms. And I'll give you a little back backstory about this because the video wasn't actually about what was happening in the background. The video was about dealing with a puppy in your first your first uh, few nights with a puppy home or how to set up for success with a young puppy. And I was working with a young puppy in that video and just holding her in my lap and waiting for her to settle and calm and relax. And the woman that I was giving the lesson to had her other dog as well in the studio with us. Uh, His name was Arthur. He's an adult dog and he wasn't necessarily loving the puppy because of course the puppy is a puppy and the puppy was spending all sorts of time wanting to jump on Arthur's head and just have a big party with Arthur and it wasn't appropriate at that moment because Arthur was getting to the end of his rope and we needed to be fair to Arthur and we needed to say you know what Arthur we're going to advocate for you. We know that you're an older gentleman and you're not interested in having this young puppy jump all over you and bounce on your your head and you know be nipping you with those puppy teeth etc so I took a hold of the puppy and was holding the puppy on my lap if the puppy wasn't on my lap in that situation I would have put the puppy in a crate because the woman that was having the lesson we were having a discussion and (laughs) Honda sniffing Swanee's eye right now we were having a discussion and we needed to focus on one another. So I had those two options. I could either hold the puppy on my lap and wait until she settled and calmed and re- and relaxed into this thing, which is actually something that we do on a regular basis with training tactics. Or I could let the puppy relax in the crate and I thought the puppy would be better off out and about and hanging out with us and just enjoying some uh, some time out of the crate in that moment. But the puppy was about, I think, nine and a half weeks old, if I, if memory serves me correctly. And uh, a comment that we got on our YouTube channel was basically surrounding, you know, the puppy doesn't want to be held, so put the puppy down. And on the surface, that seems like reasonable advice. You know, if if I was holding Swanee and she said, I don't want to be held anymore, put me down, 
I would probably comply. Why do you never hold me? <laughs> I'm, this is opening up a whole new world for me. Piggyback back to the back to the main oh, building. Yeah, that's yeah. how we're getting back to the main building after. So, I mean, it, it seems reasonable that if Swanee didn't want to be held, that I should let her go. But Swanee's an adult. Swanee is an adult woman, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm confident that Swanee can keep herself safe in this world. I'm not governed with her care in any way, shape, or form. So really, yes, I would let Swanee go. But that puppy saying, I don't want to be held anymore, sorry, pup, you don't get to struggle and get your way. And this the, this is exactly the thing we mean when we say living by your puppy's rules. Mm-hmm. So, Swanee. I'm going to bring you in on the conversation here because I've been rambling already and you're sitting there so politely waiting <laughs> I'm for me very to finish. Pol- I'm very ladylike. Finally let you in on this conversation. So tell our listeners what that feels like from the dog's perspective. Well, if I'm a puppy and I want out of my owner's arms, I'm going to learn very quickly that if I struggle, they put me down and now I can do whatever I want. Yeah. So I'm going to learn that fighting against my owner works. So basically that it's is, it's putting me in charge of the game. That is 100% the perfect answer. So ask yourself, what is the message the pup is getting? Now, on that thought, what is the message that you would like the puppy to get in that moment? I would like the puppy to understand that struggling is not going to work. Perfect. So you get put down when I feel you're ready to get put down, not when you feel you're ready to be put down. Yes. And calmness is what's going to work with me, not struggling. Absolutely. And if we can think about this from a human perspective, raising a being that is relying on us to keep them safe and give them good direction in life, we need to think about the message we want them to get. So that message that Swanee just suggested that we want the puppy to get, we want them to learn that struggling and fighting us never wins, never, ever wins. And I will tell you that you will do yourself such a favor by helping your puppy get that message when they are a youngster versus once they're an adult dog. And this was a golden retriever puppy. So, you know, she's probably... 15 pounds Mm -hmm. at the time, but going to be 65 or 70 pounds. So the last thing I want is for my puppy to start off life thinking, oh, I struggle and I fight you and I win. Mm -hmm. Because eventually that dog's probably going to be able to outmuscle me. So it is a much harder lesson for me to teach that puppy down the road once they're an adolescent or an adult or whatever the case may be. And, you know, they're trying to pull me across the street now because there's a squirrel on the other side of the road they really want to see. I don't want my my dog at that point. Now I have to figure out how to stop this situation from unfolding with a dog that thinks all I need to do is keep struggling to mm-hmm. get my way. So I would much rather teach my young nine and a half week old puppy by simply calmly restraining them. And I have absolutely no problem whatsoever with saying to a puppy, you know what, you're just going to have to hang out here on my lap until I until you relax and I decide to put you down. Mm-hmm. Or until the situation evolves of its own. And even in that that case, if I decided, okay, you know what? It's time for me to get up off this chair and move with the puppy. If I stood up and that puppy started struggling in my arms, what would you do in that scenario? I would continue to hold the puppy until the puppy was quiet. Brilliant. And what would you say to somebody who said, oh, he doesn't want to be held. He's stressed. Put him down. I would let them know that I, I can't let this puppy win in this moment. I, I want to be a good leader to my puppy. It's yes. far easier to teach a little puppy something than it is to teach an older adult. So I'm preventing a problem by continuing to hold the puppy and letting the puppy know that, hey, you're safe up here. Struggling's not going to get you what you want. Absolutely. And that is so important. And it's an easy lesson to teach when I, when we have our young puppies. Puppies who are less than, say, 12 weeks of age are incredibly cooperative by nature. Mm-hmm. So simply having that moment with the puppy where there's no harm coming to them. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying you're going to stay on my lap and I'm going to pin you to my lap and force you to physically be in this position on my lap. I'm simply holding the puppy. Right. Yes. And, you know, it, it, it was eventually this puppy just did relax and fell asleep in my arms and mm-hmm. all was great and we had a good hour long lesson and uh you know life was wonderful and there was a lot of really good information conveyed in 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 that lesson with the person that I was giving and I think that um 
anybody who's watching those things and thinking critically about the idea that this puppy doesn't want to be held, so let's put it down, really needs to rethink what that message gives to the puppy and how that how that starts to shape the puppy's view of the world. Right, yes. And, and uh, you, you see it, uh, I've worked at a vet clinic before, and wow, there's some dogs that come in, and you, you we cannot restrain the dog for yeah. anything. The dog just freaks out. Yeah. And we know that the owner has allowed this to happen. And yes. it's, uh, you know, these dogs, you know, are often, it's, it's dangerous to the employees when a dog is panicking and thrilling Absolutely. about. Yes. Oh my goodness. And dangerous to the dog as yep. well. Mm -hmm. Because now if I can't treat this dog, I need to sedate the dog. Mm -hmm. And that means I'm putting more drugs into their system. I'm right. putting more danger into the system. Like mm -hmm. there's all sorts of reasons that if you can medicate or treat your dog when they're awake and aware, mm -hmm. it's going to be so much better for exactly, them in yes. the long run. So obviously well, we're not going to do that if we're put, putting them through a procedure where it's painful, but mm -hmm. for something as simple as maybe a nail trim or something, right. you know, we, the last thing we want to do is have to sedate our dogs mm -hmm. just to trim their nails. Same I'm sorry, what at, were you going to say? the groomer. Um, Honda uh, normally would have very long hair, uh, but I do take him to a groomer to get him trimmed now. Mm -hmm. If Honda struggled with that groomer, you know, grooming tools are sharp. Absolutely. Uh, they're working with scissors. They're working with blades. Uh, yeah. the, you know, dogs can get injured and cut at the groomers. So we want our dogs to, when the groomer holds on to them so they can, you know, uh, trim around their groin or, or mm -hmm. you know, trim around their face. We want the dog to be still and yeah. to say, you know what, just relax. It's going to be over in a moment or two. Then you can, you know, shake it off. Absolutely. So I, I don't want Honda to be flailing about, you know, if I take a hold of him, you know, I expect him just to be calm and, and just, you know, relax into that. So Absolutely. we want our dogs to be, to accept being held. Absolutely. And it is incredibly stressful for everybody, including the dog. Mm -hmm including the dog, if they are fighting, 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 and especially if they've learned to fight and win, and then all of a sudden there's this situation where they're not winning, the rules are changing for them. That's very unfair. It's Yeah, exactly, Honda. You tell them. You tell them. Say, know, you taught know. me well yeah. to be settled and calm you're, for grooming. Yeah, you're a good boy <laughs> at the groomer there. You're a little bit moving around there with me, but I think we're in a different situation now. But normally he just kind of sinks right into my hands and just says, oh, you know, everything is everything is fine. Yeah. Yeah. Good boy. Absolutely. And, you know, we don't want to have that stress. So then every time you walk through that groomer's office door, the pup goes into full-on stress mode. We're in full-on stress mode. And you know what? A lot of groomers will say, Sorry, it takes me way too long to groom your dog when they're struggling. You're going to have to find somewhere else to go. Right. And of course, then what do you do? You need to keep your dog groomed and cleaned. And mm -hmm. if the groomer can't do it with the ta tactic to tactics and techniques mm -hmm. that they've developed and you're taking them to the groomer because you can't do it, then how does your dog get groomed? How right. do they stay mat free? You know, how do you do that handling with a dog who has learned to fight you and win? And again, it seems like a really small component of mm -hmm. things, but that's where it all starts is with little things like that. Oh, he doesn't want to be held. Put him down. No. He doesn't want to be held, but you know what? I know what's best for him. Mm -hmm. Just like with a child. My niece and nephew really hated their seatbelts and their car seats mm -hmm. for a very long time as youngsters. Right. But you know what? Too bad, so sad. Yep. That's what's going to keep you safe. Mm -hmm. This is not up for debate. It's not negotiable. I am the adult in this situation, and I'm responsible for you. Mm -hmm. I'm responsible for keeping you safe. I'm responsible for ensuring that you understand fighting me is never going to work for right. you. And again, this is a, in, in a situation where we're talking about struggling against you, but this can also turn to aggression with the with certain dogs mm -hmm. that say, you know what? Yeah, bring it on. I, I've won with you before, and now I'm not winning. So guess what? Right. I mean, there's always... Uh, I would say 99.9% .9 of the time. I mean, there's always exceptions to every rule, but mm -hmm. there's always reasons for the bite. Right. And a lot of the times it goes back to those simple messages that our dogs get that are very contrary to the messages that they actually need. Mm -hmm. So, and I would also, I, I would take this one step further and say that in that scenario saying, um, he doesn't want to be held, put him down. Is that appealing to what's best for the dog or is that appealing to the human emotion that feels sorry for this dog being contained or being held or whatever the case may be? And I would say that if you are in a position where you consistently put your emotional needs above the needs of the dog, you need to think 
long and hard mm-hmm. about how you are doing things and who's really benefiting from that. Because yes. in the long run, that does not benefit the dog. I want my dog to learn to just calm and relax when I restrain him. So that, yes, when I go to the groomers, when I go to the vets, when I go to any of these scenarios, my dog knows, you know what, I'm mm-hmm. here, I'm going to keep you safe. And there are rules in life that right. you need to follow but don't worry because I've got you right. and and you're not going to come to any harm. So mm. if I were to let my dog go every time he struggled, when I go to the vet and I let him go because he struggles and he thinks the vet's evil and, you know, mm-hmm. I can't medicate, like it just, it just becomes a tumbleweed problem. Yes. So, all right. I have a bunch more examples here okay. to try to keep this all in perspective and help and help people understand what we're talking about today. So uh, one of them is sniffing nonstop on walks. So mm. first tell me about how you go about a, a walk through the neighborhood. Well, when I walk my dogs, I, I'm i on a walk for myself for mm-hmm. exercise. And, uh, you know, walking's not great exercise for dogs, but it is a little bit of exercise. But mm-hmm. So we're going to go out and I expect my dog to move along with me and I dictate how fast we're going. I dictate when we stop. I dictate when we turn. It's, it's my walk, actually. Yeah. It's my walk. And the dog must follow me. I may suddenly see a bush and think, oh, I wonder if he has to lift his leg or maybe I'll let him sniff for a little bit. So um, I might suddenly stop at a bush and say, okay, go bathroom or, you know, okay, you can go sniff. Mm -hmm. Um, I may, I may not. Um, But if I do stop to let him do that, then, you know, I might, you know, 10 seconds later, okay, off we go again. Come on, on our walk. So a lot of it depends on on what the motivation is for my walk. Right. Um, It depends. If I'm walking through a park, I may stop more frequently and allow Honda to sniff a little bit. Okay. But a lot of times my walks are just brisk city walks on the sidewalk and there's nothing good to sniff on the sidewalks (laughs) of Hamilton. So we just keep on walking. (laughs) So when you get to a park, for example, Mm -hmm. do you transition at all or do you just let him go into sniff mode? Do you give him a cue? I give him a cue. So I transition. So we we get to the park. I might uh, start to hold my leash different. I might give a new command like, you know, okay, off you go. Um, go sniff. Uh, you know, I might swing my hand a little bit. Mm-hmm. My body posture changes, and Honda realizes that. Oh, okay. You know, I'm I'm I'm, I'm free now. I'm on my own to go yeah. do what I want. Then when I need him again, I call his name, and he's like, "Oh, there I am," and off we go again. Perfect. And there's another example of you know having good listening skills and having a dog that learns to comply with the things that you've asked them to do versus ignore or fight the things that you've asked them to do. Mm -hmm. This is going to work so well to your advantage and to your dog's advantage Mm -hmm. because we know that a dog who doesn't have a good recall, who we can't call back, who we can't get control of if they're off leash, spends their entire time and their entire life on leash. Exactly. So, And that's not a fun thing to do. So um, my situations are similar. If I'm Mm -hmm. taking a city walk, I have boys and I have intact boys. So they end up lifting their legs on everything that is available if that is the option mm-hmm. for them that is their main focus and truly with the walk I agree it's a team event mm-hmm. you know it's not just their walk and it's not just my walk it's our walk together right, yeah. um I, I know you said that, that it's your walk and right. he's along with it which is fine too there's right, nothing yeah. wrong with there's any some, of this well some walks are more his walk like yeah yeah like it depends on you know if I'm if I just want to get out for a good brisk walk, then that's, yep. that's my walk and you're along with me. But, you know, like, oh, let's go on a hike. Well, that now it's for both of us. Yes. Like, yes, yes. Yeah, like, we're going to stop and, you know, he can jump on a log or climb on a rock. Like, I want him to have some fun too. Yeah. 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 I was I'm trying to think of something that, that rhymed that had, e- had to do with Ewoks and logs and, you know, but it didn't work I, out. Yeah. I don't know if there <laughs> no, is I'm Ewok. Told. No, I've told yeah. everybody that it didn't work out. <laughs> I couldn't rhyme it. Um, so, I mean, my, the point that I'm trying to make is the best of both worlds, mm-hmm. right? Having the ability to say, okay, we're in the city right now. We're walking on the sidewalk. There's cigarette butts all over Hamilton mm-hmm. downtown sidewalks. There's dirty wrappers. There's, there's you know, socks. Who, whoever. There's there socks you go. on there's our streets. Socks. Yes. There's like all kinds of gross stuff. Yeah. All sorts of things that a dog might want to investigate that might be dangerous for right, them. Yeah. You know, cigarette butts are toxic yeah. for dogs. So. Or other dogs, people who haven't cleaned up after yeah. their dog. I don't want my dog sniffing that like it could be filled with parasites yeah absolutely parasites parvo like you just never know Mm -hmm. what these things are so i personally don't let my dogs sniff they might they might braise something on their Mm -hmm. way by you know they walk by something and they sniff something on the sidewalk or i certainly don't have my dogs healing with their head in the air Mm -hmm. with wrapped attention on city walks they have sort of a loose heel at my left hand side and the expectation is that they continue to move along with me and keep a relative position at my left hand side Mm -hmm. and i don't let them lift their legs on my neighbor's 
neighbor's properties. No. I don't, you know, if, if, if I'm walking and my dogs need to pee, then I'm headed somewhere for them to actually pee. And mm-hmm. then I do the same thing when we get to the park. Okay, go sniff. And now they have their opportunity Mm -hmm. where they can wander around and sniff and whatnot. There's, I'm usually doing visual checks to make sure that there's not, hello, Honda, yes, I agree. Honda I'm wants, usually doing Honda says, yeah, Honda wants you to take him for a walk right now. I keep saying yes. the word walk. Yeah. That's why he's getting it. <laughs> Although he's deaf, he doesn't. <laughs> He has no idea. No you just idea. ruined my joke. I, I know, thought it was the I best know. joke yes. of the show. <laughs> <laughs> he lip reads. Honda lip reads. There you go. Yes. He's good. He's good. I know. You're a good <laughs> lip reader. I know. I know. You're funny. So yeah, the best of both worlds and giving permission when it is acceptable for them <laughs> to sniff and for them to lift their legs and for them to enjoy time at the park. I mean, we're certainly not trying to keep them from having a wonderful life. We just want to make sure that they have a wonderful life that includes us. Mm-hmm. And we can keep them safe. And they have a wonderful long life because right. of that safety. So, yes. yeah, a trained dog leads a bigger, better life than an absolutely. untrained dog. Yes. Absolutely. 100%. Um, so, yes, let them sniff when it's an appropriate time to sniff. You know, dogs need to interact with the world. We want them to interact with the world, but it's not always a safe world for them to interact right. with. Yes. So, again, think well, about. I, we had a student once and she asked a question. She wanted to know what to do when her dog dragged her up her neighbor's driveway and onto her neighbor's front lawn to sniff. Oh my goodness. And uh, she she was so permissive with the dog that she was allowing the dog to take her onto private property to sniff. And she oh, was goodness. following the dog. Oh. And uh, yeah, so she was definitely letting yeah. that dog rule her life. You know, imagine looking out on your front lawn and there's a lady with a, a dog and she's like, well, he wanted to come up here. Oh my goodness. Can yes. you imagine? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. No, you dictate where the dog goes. Cause right. it would be the same thing if the dog decided that, oh, I want to go to the, the neighbor's house across the street and there's lots of traffic right. and I'm just yeah. going to drag you up there too. Uh, again, think about it from the dog's perspective. What message is the dog getting? What message do you want the dog to get? And are those two things conflicting? And if so, you need to set out and do some training to fix that up and Mm -hmm. to make sure that those two things start to align. You can make walking nicely at your side a very valuable thing for your dog. It's not all about saying you must, you must, you must and using heavy corrections. You know, we teach, we spend time teaching our dogs how to walk nicely at our left hand side by making it an enjoyable and pleasant place to be and by setting boundaries and limitations and saying when you start to move away from that position, I'm going to make sure that I tell you, you need to get back here. But when you're there, you get all these wonderful things in Mm -hmm. the world. And then one of my favorite, one of my dog's favorite things actually is when I say, ready, set, okay, and release Mm -hmm. them to freedom. Right. So as soon as I get that ready out, they're already feeling rewarded. And that gets attached with whatever they were doing before they got the freedom. Mm -hmm. It's not just about the freedom. Right. So there's wonderful ways to make our dogs understand these things and to help our dogs recognize that these are pleasant things to do and that there's, right. there's, there's time for the other things. Yes. You know, I can meet those sniffing needs Mm -hmm. when it's appropriate. Mm -hmm. I don't have to be, you know, being dragged to every single bush because I've let my dog sniff all the time on the walk Mm -hmm. and it's quote unquote their walk and I'm letting them call the shots and create the rules, right? I don't have to do that right you know and and it really doesn't create a well-rounded dog anyways when they don't have rules and they don't Mm -hmm. have understanding of what the rules are they like to have structure Mm -hmm. they really really they they do do. yes if you think of a lot of the breeds heritages uh like you know a a border collie would herd sheep all day yes a hound would go out and hunt they had structure and and rules and they had jobs to do yes and if we uh, give a puppy no rules and no structure no boundaries we're going against their deep genetics yeah, because absolutely. they've, they've had that for a long time. And you know, we create brats. Yeah. And, and, and often stressed out brats yeah. as well, where mm-hmm. they're, you know, they're unruly in certain circumstances, but then as soon as there's any sort of, sort of pressure or stress, they don't know how to deal with it. Mm-hmm. So they start to get even more stressed about right. the world. It's just, it's not a nice life. No. I mean, th- imagine any of us without rules and mm-hmm. order, you know, it right. would it, be, it yes. would be a little bit of a challenge. It is. Yes. Um, this next one on my list is one of my favorite ones and we mm-hmm. hear it all the time. Can you guess what I'm going to say? Is it demand barking? That's a good one, but that's not what it was. Okay. But that is a good okay. one. That is a good one. But let's talk about that one actually, because okay. that one's not even on my list. So oh. you're brilliant to bring that one up. Thank you. So let's, um, come up with a scenario here. So Honda just 
well, in that situation right there, Honda came over and gave you a little bark, bark, bark. Right. And you know? yes, now it's, very, it, it, it is Honda's dinner time right now. Mm-hmm. And I haven't fed him. And so I think he is, he's being a cantankerous 14 year old <laughs> elderly man. And he's coming over and he's say, reminding me that it's his dinner time. Cantankerous. That's cantankerous. That's what he was doing there. But, um, but you know what did what? you do in response to that? I just kind of gave him a little bit of a, you know, it was just like a little bit of a, not a push, but just mm-hmm. a little bit of a, no, 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 like yeah. a little tap, like, hey, nobody, we're not doing that right now. I'm sorry it's your dinner time, but we're busy. Yeah. And, and what did he do? He went, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. And he went and lied down. So now he's lying down. There you go. Probably got a little bit of a rumbly tumbly, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, I, yeah, I realized that's what it, it's his dinner time. And yeah. he, you know, dogs have those great internal clocks, but absolutely I, they do. I need him to be flexible. Yeah. So, and, and in this perspective, in this situation, you could have said, oh my gosh, this poor dog, he, he needs to eat. I need to feed. He's, he's not starved. That's, that's a fact. No. He had breakfast. It's just. No. And he had a cookie when we first got here too. <laughs> like when it's, I walked in here, yeah. he had a big cookie. <laughs> it's not like he hasn't eaten all day. He's just, this is his next highlight of his day and right? he wants yep. to eat and he's looking forward to it. If yep. that is in fact why he's, mm-hmm. why he's doing a little, why he did a little bit of demand barking mm-hmm. there. But just saying, you know what? Nobody. I'm not going to let my heartstrings run the show and right. run off and get you food right now because mm-hmm. it's only, what, 2.30 in the afternoon. It's right. not even really dinner time. Eats it's just getting at, close to dinner eats time. at 3. Hon- oh, well. 3 o'clock is his Honda's dinner time. Well, there so, you go. We'll but, have to make sure we're wrapped on this podcast. Oh, no, 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 no. He's, he's <laughs> no, fine. I'm he's fine, yes. But either way, you know, if you mm-hmm. had put your needs first, right. your emotional needs first mm-hmm. to stop feeling bad for this dog because he's barking at you because he's hungry and Mm -hmm. gone and fed him. What would that say about him demand barking? Well, tomorrow it would start even earlier. Yeah. He would start about 10 minutes earlier saying, you know what, Christine, Swanee, it's time to eat. Come on, let's get this show on the road. Put those kibbles in the bowl. You know what it makes me think of is the kid in the grocery store screaming. I want the chocolate bar. Give right. me the chocolate yep. bar. And yep. then, of course, if the human is embarrassed enough and gives in, the kid mm-hmm. goes, ooh, that worked. That worked. And they scream louder next time. Yep. Very similar with our dogs. And, you know, demand barking is something that we should definitely just not let right. ever get rewarded mm-hmm. and reinforced. So, yes. again. Because they'll demand bark to play. Yeah. Uh, you know, they they do all, you know, dogs often come up and will, you know, bark at you because they, they want you to start playing. And then when you don't start playing, they yeah. jump up and they'll grab at your sleeves, grab at your pant legs. Yeah. You know, they're basically saying, hey, I'm running the show here. Like, come on, yep. let's get going. You exactly. better play with me. So if I had said, oh, Swanee, he's barking. Give him what he wants. What would you have said to me? I would have said, <laughs> Shannon, you take him home then and you deal with the consequences. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say, no, I don't want to. So perfect. No, Bang you on would the money. say, Christine, those are the words I've been waiting for. You <laughs> and Honda would have just... We would have heard a door slam. <gasps> yeah. And, and you, know, you and Honda would have ran off into the sunset. Into the sunset, the soft music yep. playing, and Swanee going, that backfire, and I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Oh, that's hilarious. Mm-hmm. All right. So what I actually did have on my list here is the puppy nipping. Mm. If they're nipping, give them a toy. If they're nipping, do oh, this. Yes. If they're nipping, you know I don't want my puppy nipping me. I don't want my adult dog biting me. I want my dog to learn unequivocally immediately that nipping me is not an acceptable thing. And so if we think about this from the dog's perspective, they start nipping and we give them a toy. What is that? What message does that give the dog? The dog says that nipping gets a reward. Right. And what is the message that we want our dogs to get when it comes to nipping? That nipping is never allowed. Exactly. So. Nipping gets nothing. Yeah. So I really, this advice is advice that flies around in all sorts of dog circles. And it is not advice that we would ever recommend taking. You know, this is where things like a little bit of a passive restraint or a bit of a collar correction or something that says to the puppy, you are not allowed to bite me, is worth its weight in gold. Mm -hmm. You know, there are some puppies that grow out of puppy nipping but they're very few and far between. Yes. In my experience, mm-hmm. nipping puppies just become nipping adolescents who become biting adults. Right. You know, yes, nipping is a very natural puppy behavior. 100%. Mm-hmm. I can have a million miles of empathy for every single puppy and their teeth and the reasons that they use their teeth. And and I completely can appreciate that it's play behavior. And 
And sometimes I even think, well, I'm glad my puppy likes me and wants to play with me. That's great. Mm -hmm. But this is not an acceptable way of playing in a human world. Mm -hmm. And especially if you have kids. Mm -hmm. And if you or elderly people too. Yes. Skin is very fragile. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, It's so important to nip this in the bud. No pun intended. Yay. But maybe a little pun intended Uh because it's kind of a cute one. Right. But truly seek some help if you're not sure what to do. But try not to placate the puppy. Try not to say, oh, you know what? You're biting. So I'm going to give you a toy for that. Because again, the message is is not clear for the puppy. And we want to give our dogs clear information. The last thing Mm -hmm. I want to do is have nipping continue in this vicious cycle through my dog's adolescence and adulthood. And we help people every day every day with nipping except for maybe Sundays because we're off on Sundays everything (laughs) is closed but we help people every day with nipping and it can start with the eight and a half week old puppy who just needs the tiniest little bit of this is what's Mm -hmm. going to happen if you nip and basically it's a bit of a passive restraint you know I might I might scoop my puppy into my side hold their collar and stop them from moving so it takes all the fun out of the situation and it's not meant to be mean or rough but at eight and a half weeks old It's easy to convince a puppy. Once you hit, you know, 11 and 12 weeks, it starts to get a little bit harder. And dealing with a nipping 16-week-old puppy or a nipping six-month-old puppy Mm -hmm. is a whole different ball of wax. And again, I question the fairness of the information of of people who want to say, oh, if he's nipping, just give him a toy instead. Because it lets the puppy think that nipping is okay. And then it continues. Mm -hmm. And the puppy continues to think this is a viable way to create play scenarios with Mm -hmm. their human or the other dogs in the house or the elderly people that come over to visit or whatever the case may Mm -hmm. be. And then suddenly, you know, the humans just had enough because now they've got a seven month old, 65 pound golden retriever who is jumping at them and nipping. Mm -hmm. And you know, the needle teeth hurt with puppies, but those adult teeth really, really hurt too. And And people also use the excuse of their teething. They're teething. So let them do that. It's like, no, 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 no. No, and that definitely, nipping and teething are two very different mm-hmm. animals. I actually have a, uh, an article on our website, um, nipping versus teething, the truth and the difference. That would be a really insightful read for anybody who's thinking that the nipping is due to teething mm-hmm. and trying to figure out how they can sort of let the puppy off the hook because of the nipping thing. No. No, yeah, it, it, go and read that article. It's a great one, and I think it will help to put things in perspective, and it'll give you a good path on how to help address the nipping. Mm-hmm. We also have tons of YouTube videos that will help with the nipping and biting trouble. Often there's a whole lot of different things that you need to do to get nipping under control. It's not necessarily just this one, you know, disciplinary measure, mm-hmm. so to speak, but we really do need to give our puppies clear information and our young dogs clear information to provide clarity for them and help them move forward in our lives. Because now once the nipping problem is over, we can love our puppies right. yes. and we can train them and we can teach them all sorts of wonderful things. But on a daily basis, mm-hmm. you know, just today I was answering a question in our Facebook group from our Puppy Essentials program. And uh, the person was basically saying, you know what, we can't even touch this puppy. Our kids are afraid to be with mm-hmm. this puppy because every time they even go to pet him, all he does is want to nip. And again, very natural puppy behavior. Right. That's it's how not- they play in the litter. Yes. They, they learn when they're tiny puppies that, you know, nip another puppy and that puppy turns and plays with you. Exactly. And then they nip, 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 nip. And that's how they play. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. And us allowing it to go on really just creates so much confusion for the puppy. And it creates a scenario that's really not nice for the whole family. Mm-hmm. You know, those kids should be enjoying their puppy. They should be learning mm-hmm. how to do some training and teach tricks. And they should be able to pet their puppy. Right. You yes. know, without the puppy turning around and nipping. Mm-hmm. And it really can be an easy solution if you have the belief system in place that says... I need some rules for this puppy and he needs to understand that nipping me is not acceptable versus saying, oh, you know what? He's nipping. It's a natural puppy behavior. So I'm going to, I'm going to give him a toy because you know, that seems like something that will stop the nipping, but it's a band aid. Yes. Mm -hmm. The puppy's not going to be nipping you now because he's chewing on a toy or he's playing with a toy. However, it's a band aid. Right. An hour from now, he's going to be nipping you again. Yeah. And as soon as he loses interest in that toy, it might not even be an hour. Right. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. A new person walks by and he's going to be at their pant legs. Absolutely. So I I love that one in terms of making sure that you Mm -hmm. do not live by your dog's rules with puppy nipping. So important for creating a well-rounded adult that doesn't bite. All right. Greeting manners. Mm. This is a big one because Mm -hmm. this is one that is a challenge for a lot of people. We have friendly dogs. Excuse me. We have friendly dogs and they can be a little bit tough to contain for greeting manners. Mm -hmm. And we have 
worried dogs, and they can be hard with greedy manners, mm-hmm. and we have dogs that are boisterous that can be hard. You know, there's all sorts of reasons that greeting manners right. can be hard. Mm-hmm. So um, what are your thoughts with um, things like, so for example, walking down the street and there's a puppy that's really excited because there's a human coming along, mm-hmm. and uh, the human coming along is looking at the puppy and thinking, oh my gosh, so cute. And I want to say hello. And the puppy's trying to pull towards that person. And the person says, oh, it's okay. I don't mind if he pulls at me and jumps all over me and, 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 and. So what do you think about that? Well, I always say I mind. Yes. (laughs) Because he's, I'm allowing my puppy to rehearse a behavior and the puppy's going to feel that behavior is now right. Yeah. So, um, they, they pulled to the person. They so again, jumped. message that the puppy is getting. Right, yeah. It's good to pull and jump all over a person because that person will bend down and pat you. And the patting is, in essence, reward yes. for what you're doing. The puppy got what they wanted. Absolutely. So even though it seems so innocent, it's, mm-hmm. it snowballs on you. Yeah, it does. It absolutely does. And it lets the puppy think that it's fine to do. And you know what? It's it's adorable to have a 10-week-old puppy jump all over you, but it's not adorable yes. to have a 10-month-old puppy jump all over you when they're Absolutely. 80 pounds. And suddenly now we're changing the rules. And the puppy's like, well, what do you mean? I've been, for the last like six weeks, I've been diving all over people. What do you mean now I can't? Yeah. It is so kind when we think about it from the pup's perspective. So what are some things that you might do in that scenario? So somebody's coming, and and this is something too, please don't be the person that comes down the street and sees the puppy and the person trying hard to train or contain the puppy and goes, oh, puppy, and comes flying mm -hmm. at the puppy. Please don't be that person. Please take a moment, stop. If you want to interact with the puppy, that is absolutely understandable because they're adorable Mm -hmm. and we love them. And you know what? If I'm training a puppy, I probably want my puppy to be able to say hello to people too, but I want to be able to do so under my terms. So please ask the person, Mm -hmm. you know, oh, hey, can I say hello to your puppy rather than just flying right at the puppy? You know, it is... uh, it's so tempting, but it's so important that that poor puppy doesn't get overfaced and the human right. has a chance. Yes. So, yeah. It, well, it, even um, the other day, I was walking along uh, Main Street in Hamilton, and it's a very busy street, and uh, the sidewalk's quite busy. And I saw a lady approaching with a, a large white, it looked like a kubas type okay. breed. And I could tell she was training the dog. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't cross the street with Honda because there's four lanes of of traffic going a million miles an hour. And so I thought, well, I don't want to, I don't want to set this dog up to fail. And I could tell it was a young dog. So I picked up Honda and we went as far as we could away from that dog. And I smiled at the lady and I said, oh, just making it easier for you. And, uh, you know, I didn't let Honda run up to her. I didn't put Honda in her dog's face. I I respected the fact that she was working her dog and her dog successfully saw Honda and was able to successfully hold a sit as a Honda and I walked by and I thought, you know, that was great. That yes. was a great training moment for that dog and that lady. Absolutely. You know, uh, or I could have completely ruined that training moment for her too by yes. allowing Honda to rush up to her dog. Yeah. So recognize when other people are training and, and be polite. Help yeah. them. Absolutely. I could not possibly agree more. And again, these scenarios lead to... If my puppy is now, ooh, there's a person coming at me and I am going to pull to go and visit that puppy, again, ask yourself, what is the message that my puppy is getting? Pulling is rewarding. And we don't want, we we might be able to contain that 10-week-old puppy mm-hmm. that's pulling us, but when that puppy is now 65 pounds and an adult female golden retriever, mm-hmm. you know what? This is probably going to take a little bit more muscle and... Th- it would have been so much easier right. to do a little bit of work mm-hmm. earlier and not let those things get reinforced. Yes. So I always say, don't let the puppy do what you would, don't let the puppy do what you wouldn't want the adult dog to do. Exactly. Yes. So that, if you don't want your adult dog to jump, then don't let the puppy yeah, jump. Yeah, absolutely. Set the rules right from the beginning. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you can do things like if you've got a young puppy and you want them to greet people, pick them up so that they're not rehearsing mm-hmm. the the situation where they're pulling towards the person. And then, 
by the time you get to a little bit of an older puppy, you'll have had time to put some skills on the puppy. But when they're still that young and they don't have any skills yet, all we can do is manage the situation so that they don't get the wrong message and they Mm -hmm. don't get that message that's conflicting with what you want them to do. What do I want my dog to do in this scenario? Well, I probably want my dog to be polite and remain on a Mm -hmm. loose lead at my left hand side and then greet the person politely. Mm -hmm. What is my puppy thinking that is okay in this scenario, right. pulling to the person? And those two things are very conflicting. So I need to make an adjustment mm-hmm. in my strategy if yeah. that's the case. I'll always have good treats in my pocket too. And if I have a dog that's a little bit maybe too old to hold, for me to hold, mm-hmm. then maybe I will say, well, hang on a sec and I'll get some good treats out. Tactic. And I'll let my dog like nibble and chew on the treats and I'll let the person come in and give them a couple of pats as I'm letting them eat these treats and nibble and chew on them. And the dog got rewarded for being calm. The person got to pat the dog. So it was a win-win situation. I actually, um, when it comes to pulling behaviors, I like to nip this in the bud really, really early with my puppies. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about other people on the street. It's also about anything the puppy wants. Right. So basically... I want my dog to understand that anytime that leash goes tight, it's their responsibility to make an adjustment Mm -hmm. in the leash. So when I have my baby puppies at home, I will make a point of taking something that they might show a little bit of mild interest in. So it might be an empty box, for example. Mm -hmm. I start out with something that's super benign, not Mm -hmm. that exciting, but it's going to have some sort of interest with the puppy. So I might put a small empty box on the ground and I've got my puppy on leash. And basically when my puppy goes to investigate that thing, I just plant my feet. And when he realizes that he's not getting there because this leash is holding him back and then he loosens on the leash somehow. So he might turn back towards me or he might just sit, continue to stare at the thing. But basically when my puppy makes the choice to take the pressure off that leash, that's when then I will allow them to move forward. So then I'll say, okay, and I'll move forward a step or two. If the leash tightens again as they're heading to investigate the box, I do the same thing. And it doesn't take a lot of skill. I just plant my feet, Mm -hmm. I hold steady on the leash, and I simply don't let them pull forward. And then when they choose to loosen the leash, that's when they get the message that, okay, now you can move forward again Mm -hmm. because you're not putting pressure onto that leash. So there's a great little exercise you can practice with your young puppies. It doesn't take much skill at all, but basically it gives them the information that you can't just pull to get whatever you want. Right, yes. Pulling is not allowed, and it's not going to be reinforced. And that way when things get more serious Mm -hmm. down the road and I start to teach them leash manners and leash respect and things like that, it's not new news for them. Mm -hmm. They're already well ahead of the game because they already realize pulling doesn't ever get me anywhere. And if I know that I need to get somewhere with my puppy Mm -hmm. and I think there's a possibility they're going to pull, I pick them up Mm -hmm. so that I can take. So for example, if we need to get out to the yard because they need to pee, I scoop them up, we walk out to the yard, Mm -hmm. I put them down in the spot that I want them to go and then I plant my feet at that point. So yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a nice way of making sure that they don't get that conflicting information. Right, yes. And people need to be patient too. Um, a lot of times, our human nature, we want to skip to the end and we skip yes. steps. And But yeah. we need to be patient with our puppies. And, it's true. And take that time so they understand. Yeah, I always joke that uh, when people start puppy essentials or life skills, they're often already looking for the university level exam. Like, right. well, how do I stop my puppy from pulling? Well, you need to teach these skill right, f- yes. skills first. How do I make sure that my dog comes when they're called every single time? Mm-hmm. Well, you need to teach this. Yes. Like, this is a step-by-step progression. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's going to come together, but it's going to take some time right. because you're educating another being. And that other being is also developing, mm-hmm. and they have desires of their own as well. So right. we need to take things step-by-step mm-hmm. and help our dogs understand what the rules are in our human world. And consistency is such an important quality to that. It really, really is. Um, the the next thing on my list, can you take a guess? I might have another good one in there. He came oh, up with the demand. How about not thing. using the crate because the puppy ah, doesn't like it? Ding, ding, is ding, that ding, on there? Yeah. That that's yep. the next one on my list. Right. Yeah. So it's a couple of a couple of things on my list. So one is making noise in the crate. So right. the well meaning person who comes over and hears your puppy crying in the crate and says, Oh, he doesn't like it in there, let him out. What are you telling that person? Well, I'm telling that person that the puppy needs to learn to remain in the crate. He's safe in the crate. He's not rehearsing bad behaviors. He's, it's a safety zone for him. Perfect. And, um, the person that says, oh, he doesn't want to sleep in the crate. Let him sleep in the bed with you. Ah. Telling that person, (laughs) if you were the person that liked your dogs to sleep in the bed with you. Oh, okay. (laughs) Um, I would say no, the, the dog has to learn to sleep on the floor on his own in his crate. There you go. Um, yeah, that is just, 
you know, it, it, sleeping in the bed is a privilege mm-hmm. um, that some people extend to their dogs, but it's not a band aid. It's not a band aid to get through the night with a puppy. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's true. I um I love my dogs to sleep in the bed. I don't mind it one bit. Once they're adults, once they mind well, mm-hmm. once they understand the rules of the house, mm-hmm. I like to have their snugglies <laughs> all in my bed. <laughs> but. It's important that my puppy can make it through an entire eight hours Mm -hmm. without getting into mischief in the house. Because the last thing I want to do is wake up and find some sort of a mess Mm. or find they've gotten into mischief or they've gotten into danger, et cetera. So, you know what? It is definitely the kinder thing to keep them safe and keep them contained in the crate. You know, initially with young puppies, sometimes you get a little bit of crying and you get sometimes with puppies, you get a lot of crying. Mm -hmm. My first toller was horrendous to crate train. He was the loudest dog. And I'm sure I made tons of mistakes and I'm sure I reinforced at the wrong times. And, you know, this is going back to 2001. So I was pretty fledgling in my dog dog training and I'm sure that I made things worse by feeling bad for him. And when I would hear him cry and I would go to him sometimes and say, you know what, you're going to be fine. You just need to relax in there. I'm sure I didn't realize that those sorts of things were really reinforcing to right. him. Yes. So I actually made things worse and I made things harder for him when I think back in hindsight. And again, that was in trying to be kind. It was in trying to, you know, feeling bad for mm-hmm. this pup because he was tugging on my heartstrings with his crying, but it wasn't the right thing to put my emotions in front of his needs. Right. And what I should have done was just held fast and strong mm-hmm. and, you know, helped him to get used to the crate because there's a lot of reasons that we crate. And we've actually done, I think we've done an episode on crate training, but we have tons of YouTube videos on crate training as well. And one of the biggest reasons that we crate train our puppies besides keeping them safe is to create confident independence. Yes. Because if my puppy at a young age figures out that crying in the crate gets me to let him out, then he's going to use that as as that as a tactic to get out of the crate and be in the company of somebody or something. Mm -hmm. So whether it's myself or somebody else in the household or another dog, perhaps, basically I'm teaching my dog to be needy. Mm -hmm. I'm teaching my dog not to be confident solo. If he learns that, you know what, my crying doesn't get me anywhere. And when I relax, eventually I get out and life is great. And you know, there's no big deal and there's no harm done. He learns to be confidently independent. He learns... People, as I say, people create their own separation yes, anxiety. Absolutely. Pe- yeah. That by doing that, you're creating separation anxiety. Yes. And it feels like it's not. It feels like you're trying to right. be kind to the puppy. And this is where it gets confusing, mm-hmm. right? So think about it. Is it good for the puppy to have that structure of the crate and to learn to be confidently independent and to learn not to get anxious when they have mm-hmm. to be alone? Or is it more important to make yourself feel better by letting them out of the crate because you feel sorry for them that they're crying? You know, when when my uh, niece and nephew are like, I don't want to go to school today. It's a nice day out. I'd much rather be playing. I get it. But... Mm-hmm this is important for right, you. Yep. You need to be educated. And I would love to say yes and give you the world. And right. yes, you can play and you can stay home and you don't ever have to go to school again because you don't want to. But right, that yep. sounds silly when I say it out loud, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Because it's so obvious right. that they need to go to school. They need yes. to get educated. It's for the greater good. You know, it's the same thing a lot of the times for our dogs. Yes. So yes. P- dogs are very black and white creatures. Yes, they are. Uh, whereas we are black, white, and gray. Yeah. We, we see gray areas and, and we can understand them too. Yeah. Whereas our dog can't. It's yes. either I did it or I didn't. Yeah. I won or I lost. It's, yeah. yeah, there's no in between. So we can't play in those in between areas because that confuses the dog. It does. It's Very not, well said. Yeah, it's not kind to the dog. No, it definitely is not. So in conclusion, think about those things. What message is the dog getting? What message do you want the dog to get? And are those things conflicting? What's being reinforced in that scenario? And like thinking about it from the dog's perspective really will make you a better dog trainer. Mm -hmm. And on that note, I'm Instructor Shannon. Instructor Swanee. And Honda. And Honda. Happy training. (laughs) The McCann Dogs Podcast is brought to you by McCann Professional Dog Trainers. We help dog owners to have a well-behaved, four-legged family member. Please give us a call at 905 659-1888 659-1888 or visit us at mccandogs.com. Happy training!